and welcome, Clive Burke. We, uh, you are with Dayon, which at least for now, I suppose, is best known as the maker of the Verify Health app. Clive, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having us. Appreciate it. So I know Verify is currently being used or about to be used by American Airlines, Alaska Airlines, British Airways, probably some others. Uh, what are you learning from these initial implementations and what still needs to be fixed? We're actually learning a lot and there's still quite a, work, a lot of work to do. So, you know, in some ways, um, where we are is all, American are using us for all international flights. Uh, British Airways are using us for flights into the UK and flights into the US. Alaskan are coming on stream and there's quite a number of airlines in the queue who are coming live in the next month or so. So there's a lot going on. What we're seeing is um, levels of interest that spans the globe. So from Japan to Australia to Africa uh, and across the US and so on. One of the key lessons that we're learned is that, and, and this is not something we can necessarily fix immediately, is passengers are pretty frustrated by the processes themselves. And as you know, the processes have been tightened up uh, by a number of governments in recent weeks. So all we can do for now is, is implement public policy and implement as quickly as possible in an agile fashion as close to the time that it comes live. But what it's clear is that the policies that are in place today will probably and hopefully will get dialed back. And that will be necessary for passengers to say, I'm willing to, more and more passengers to say, we're willing to travel again. So that just simply the processes have gotten so complex now that it creates a kind of a, it, it creates an impediment to travel, but also creates a, a somewhat of a fear factor. The same way before where if you had complex visa requirements to travel somewhere, it would, even if you applied for the visa successfully, you'd still be a little bit trepidatious before you arrived, whether you get into that place and so on. So that's one thing that we've learned. Another thing that we've learned is the readiness to, and Alan talked about it quite well earlier, you know, the digital proof of vaccine credential uh, the readiness of the different public sectors uh, or governments around the world for that. The European Commission, for example, surveyed the member states and got a mixed results around readiness to provide APIs. I mean, everybody has a plan, but when they'll be ready. And those will be needed if, and we're not saying that vaccination credentials will be needed for travel. COVID tests we know will be needed for travel, but not saying that vaccinations will be. But if they are required, it would be much better if there is those digital proof of credential available to any of the health passes, not just the Verify app itself. Another thing that we've learned from passengers as well is that they don't just want an app that gets them through the airline aspects of the airport. They want to be able to, as was discussed by Alan and others earlier, they want to get through some of the other choke points. And so we need this credential to actually enable people, whether it's their biometric and their phone or and their identity wallet or both, to get through the friction points like bag drop, or how about even enabling payments within the airport, or going from curbside, or in, in our vision, go from home to home or home to hotel. That you can satisfy all. Of so there's actually quite a few learnings along the way. And the last one, and I'll stop talking. It's a it's a big question though, you know. So, um, there's a conversation about apps and passes, but actually, and then others are having conversation about SDKs and linking into the uh, into the airline apps. But it's more than that. So sometimes you need the standalone app just to be agile to implement government policies because it's changing so quickly. Other times you want to be able to integrate into the uh, airline app so you can have one app at the check-in or at the boarding gate so that all the status can be showed in, in, according to you. Other times you want an API because all you want is someone to be able to pull the data from the health pass after it's been processed just the status to say someone has been cleared, they've done their attestation, they've got their COVID neg negative COVID tests and so on. But all of that can be passed as a flag in so someone can remotely check in. So it's for, from our perspective with Verify, we feel that all of those requirements are required. And then finally, not everybody can persuade the passengers to download an app. Like in some geographies, an app is heavy, it then affects the data. The passengers have to pay for that data download, the data transfer rates are lower. So, and then so, in, and also the penetration or let's say the adoption of their airline app uh, within some passenger bases is really low. So you need to have some sort of web interface. So like it's a browser based or I get to a web page and I can process from there. It's not necessarily all contained in that. So anyway, that's, that's the lessons that we're learning uh, and that's less, lessons learned from the operations we have today. So, so that's a lot there that, that yeah. now, needs to be addressed. Yeah, no. So you've given us a lot to think about. So uh, the way it stands right now, the Verify app is a standalone app, correct? Standalone app with an API and soon to have an option for an SDK as well. So 
Okay, so then I, I guess you referenced some of Alan's comments there related to the airline apps. Do you see eventually the, the best solution that it would be housed within the travel brand app, whether that's the airline, the hotel, whatever it might be? I think that it will be a good solution for some travelers for some scenarios. I think a standalone app will be a better solution for other travelers who are saying, I actually want to be able to pay with this and I want to be able to book my taxi with this or my grand transportation and I want to be able to check into a hotel. So in which case, the airline app may not be the logical place for it. But at the same time, the airline app may need to know about it for those travelers who prefer to use that. Back to my point about you can coexist. You can have yeah. some travelers traveling on that flight, members of the Verify service, where the data has been surfaced through the airline app. Others, data has been surfaced through some web functionality. Others where they have a standalone app. That's how, that's how I look at it. And what about this question? Um, Alan, again, made the comment that he sees standards as more important than this question of interoperability. We seem to be hearing about those two things in tandem. What we're, what's your take on that? My, my take is similar in the sense that I don't see the passes like app to app talking to each other. But I do see behind that the identity being interoperable. So a, in, in, in Verify, the identity data is stored on the user's device. It's released by the user with their permission. It's really their credentials secured by them on their device, using the same security that we implement in our business for access to bank accounts or proven payments and so on. So at that level around the identity data, that has to be interoperable. So if I'm going to release that information to a hotel and go to release it to an airline, there has to be standards around that, rather than standards around the Verify pass app talking to the IATA pass, for example. So I agree that, that maybe at that level, that's not needed. Then as you dig deeper into the process, then you do need standards for common ways to handle these things, common views on privacy and security. Most of us are looking at it around the user controls their identity, and that's a really good way to look at it, which then brings in that conversation about privacy we were having earlier. We said, actually, we'll come out of this with a better outcome on privacy, because yes, it is the same data, and we were sharing it already today, but now we're moving some of that under the user's control so they can decide who they're going to share with. And if they don't want to be part of the, let's say, the partnership framework of some app, they can just say, I only release the data to for the purpose of my travel. I just want to get through the airport, that type of stuff. And what about Gloria made the distinction between a health passport that stores potentially all of someone's health records, as she described it, versus a health pass that is a bit more of a one-time use? I, I see them very different. So there's, there is a separate people out there, separate to what you see with Fairfly or some, talking about health apps, and those health apps can go broader. And possibly due to COVID, we'll all have a heightened awareness and desire for those things. And that will be again done with the user's consent and permission and stuff like that. But And I also see the passes that might unlock the internal economy is very different to someone traveling. With travel, what I need is I need to be able to get through the airport. I need to be able to prove my... COVID status, I need to be able to do the attestations that are required. I need to be able to check into hotels and stuff like that into it. But that, that pass, that's what we need. That's what Verify is aimed at, right? A health pass is like all my other requirements. So I think they're very different in, in some sense. Okay. And um, did you say, so are you talking um, with sectors beyond airlines right now? I mean, where does that stand? Cruise lines, hotels? We are definitely talking to cruise lines and hotels, but staying within the travel focus. So within the travel focus, we're talking to some big brand hotel chains uh, about how this can enable check-in and um, how it can enable self-check-in. So really when you arrive at the hotel, you're just picking up your room key. I mean, long-term it might change to how do you get straight to the door of the, your hotel room and so on. Also right. cruise lines, they're struggling to get back in the same way with airlines. How do they get back in business? And therefore a significant aspect of that is how do you verify the status of the COVID status and all, any other declarations the passenger may need if they're traveling around the world? And remember, it's not just submitting my COVID test. Every country has these forms that you need to fill out. So in our app, what we're doing is we have this forms capability in Verify that we can quickly configure those forms to reflect the public sector requirements of the day. And they are changing, as you know, on a, maybe not a weekly basis, but every two weeks and so on. Right. So there's a lot of things that the passenger has to do, and we're taking that paperwork out of there, removing the need for them to do that on paper and doing it within the app or within the application. So I know that Dayon recently signed on with the Good Health Pass Collaborative. Can you tell us a bit more about that and why it's important and, and what that might mean as far as next steps? 
Yeah, one thing that we thought about that was we saw um, partners of ours like uh, MasterCard working on it and they came to us and said, we think this is interesting. We found that, um, you know, we do need as a group, as an industry across all the stakeholders to collaborate as much as possible in order to get the economies back, get the travel back, get us all moving again. And not everybody's going to be able to address all the requirements. So one thing that we liked about their approach was inclusivity. So they were saying, we're not going to dictate a single app or solution for everybody. It should be, there should be choice, which is something we espouse. There should be choice for government, there should be choice for airlines, and there should be choice for users, which direction they take and how they go. So that's quite important. And that was one of the key principles that the Go Health Pass is espousing. So we like that. Also in terms of uh, inclusivity. So they're, they're, one of their principles is that this is something that should work for everybody all around the world. And again, if I talked earlier about the interest we're getting from Africa, from Japan, from the US, UK, and so on, this has to be an inclusive solution. This has to be inclusive um, answer rather than the word solution is the wrong word, answer. Really. So that's why we like the Good Health Pass initiative. So let's talk about that topic of inclusivity really um, in two angles. First of all, um, related to the different strategies and solutions that you're seeing develop around the globe. Are you seeing differences um, or are you seeing more of a cohesive mindset and, and strategy? Definitely seeing differences still. So some are coming at it from the health perspective, like we talked about earlier, saying we're really specialists in health data or tests or whatever, and they're extending them to say, we can take that into travel. Then there's others who are saying, we're in the travel business, so we're gonna take it from a ticketing, boarding pass perspective, and extending that into the health pass. And then there's people like ourselves coming from an identity perspective, and that's what our expertise is in. And we've been doing that 20 years, and then we took that to develop Verify. So that's where the differences are lying from. There are some very com common principles Hopefully most people are adhering to the users in control of their data, the data stored on their device. Obviously you need to store some data within the service to be compliant with the airline and carrier, the carrier requirement, the airline partners requirements and the government requirements. So for example, you have to store the US uh, Center for Disease Control Attestation for two years. So there's a requirement to store that for a number of years and so on. So okay. those sort of things have to be addressed. And then what about related to the question of inclusivity? You know, what about the people that maybe don't have a smartphone or it's aren't, super aren't question. It's a Super question. And it is really important. And again, what we're trying to say to our partners is design process that includes everybody and don't make one, let's say the smartphone one, the more convenient one and the others, the less convenient one. So, so for example, you should be able to, and we see this as a future capability. You should be able to complete the whole process through a browser. So let's say you complete it through a browser at home, you don't have a smartphone, but you have a computer, you've used that for check-in or you've used that to buy your ticket or someone you know has access that gives you help, help you with that. So then you should be able to do your COVID declarations and upload your COVID test results and have all that processed before you come to the airport. And then there'll be a flag in the Flairfry service that when you go to check-in, they can say, oh, that passenger, Clive, has already completed the process uh, or even it'll appear in his boarding pass. So that person doesn't really need to have their smartphone at the airport and so on, or to have a smartphone at all. So that's one way to deal with that. Um, you know, this question was asked earlier, I believe, of Alan. Do you believe that we will start to see some fundamental changes in the layout and processes at airports? You know, will we have temperature kiosks throughout a facility, virus kiosks, that sort of thing? We definitely see changes in the airports coming. And as you know, we have some... Uh, big airport partners and customers as well, like Denver Airport, who signed on for Verifly last year. And some of those forward-leaning airports like Denver and others, they're all talking about the fact that the airports will need to change. Some of them talked about the fact that they had some of those ideas in mind, but there wasn't really a strong commercial driver to make these changes happen. And now with COVID, it's being enforced. As an example, in Denver, you have a Verifly lane that a vulnerable passenger group can actually say, I want to go through those lanes. I want to reserve a time slot in security. So there's a 15 minute window. So I don't have to go through in a crowd. I can decide to go through at a period where I know exactly how many people will be going through, spaced out. I can go through a go into a dedicated train carriage within the airport to move between terminals. And that's one example of an airport changing. But there are other examples as well. Like some airports are talking to us saying, because of social distancing requirements, we now need to use all the airport security lanes for passengers. 
So previously we were using them for crew and for staff. We need to move those to a different location in the airport. If we do that, we still need to find a way to make sure we securely transfer the mare site. So we need to bind the identity of the person that went through that remote screening somewhere else to when they come airside. So those are the sort of changes we see as well. Also, I yeah. see a lot more contactless within airports. And contactless can be achieved in two ways. One is you can use your device and scan it in the wallet on your device, or you can simply look at a camera and use your face to authenticate or verify yourself. And a combination of both is probably going to be the answer. And that means we can streamline some of the choke points through the airport. We can actually make it a richer experience as well. Could you imagine if you could pay for stuff in the retail environment at the airport by simply looking at a camera? So I don't have to hand over my boarding pass because it's resolved my identity. It knows what my boarding pass is. I don't have to hand over my card. I don't have to tap the keys if it's not contactless and so on. So you, you can make a purely contactless experience for the retail environment using biometrics and smart devices and so on. So there's yeah. a lot of changes coming in airports, I would say. So I was actually going to ask that question because I know, as you referenced, Dayon has more than 20 years of experience in biometric identity solutions with facial recognition, voice recognition, that sort of thing. So can you just build on that a bit more about how that biometric technology can facilitate that seamless travel experience as we're talking about safer and seamless today? For sure. So for example, if you've done a remote check-in and you get to the airport and you want to do a bag drop, you could go up to the bag drop machine and drop your bag, look at a camera, scan your phone, and it would do facial recognition to find your identity to the identity on your phone, link that to your bag, and then you can actually do the bag drop yourself. So now I've done the bag drop uh, in a really secure way, but that bag is bound to my identity just using biometrics. And that's one example of what you might do. You could be going through a fast track lane in the airport where instead of having someone check that you're eligible to come through fast track, or even you can just walk through and use your face to verify because you've pre-booked your fast track lane and so on. Those are some examples of what you might do. Do you, um, as we're getting close to the end of our time here, I'm just curious, do you think solutions such as that um, are maybe a bit on the back burner now as people are really focused on these COVID related solutions or do you see things still developing rapidly in those areas? I, they're definitely developing rapidly in those areas. Uh, right now, obviously, with 10% or 5% occupancy of airplanes in some markets, of course, people are just focused on getting people back on planes. But other other airports are saying, when people come back, we just need to be able to get them through faster, and we need to get away from the crowds we experienced before. People are going to be very conscious about being in crowds in the future. So these solutions are really important. So it's definitely getting me a lot of interest in that area. Yeah, and I guess that would be my final question then of what do you see really sticking around once, you know, we can say that maybe we are beyond uh, this COVID crisis, um, these digital health passports, for example, you think that's a permanent feature? Uh, it's really hard to say, you know, I think you'll always need to have a health status as a traveler in future, given what we've just learned as a globe. But whether that health status could be managed in the same way as your visa status and things could well be, you know, better way for the traveler, better for the uh, airline, better for the governments and so on. But the health status will still need to be transferred with you, whether that's uh, within a wallet on your phone, whether that's linked to your travel documents or some other way. And remember, we're going to have to do this for domestic travel as well as for international travel, because there's quite a bit of domestic travel over long distance as well, and free movement within the Schengen area and so on. So. There's a lot of things to consider there. So I believe that some form of health status is going to be here for the for the forever, basically. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Clive, for sharing your insights. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much as well. Thank you for the questions. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Linda, for our next session.